Training to failure, not better for gains. Study breakdown next. What's up guys, back with another educational video and this week we are talking about training to failure versus not training to failure. But first, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment for the algorithm. So this comes about because there was just a new study published hot off the press, actually conducted by my powerlifting coach, Zach Robinson, as well as some other great co-authors. There are a lot of things I really loved about this study design. But first, let's talk about what the overall theme of the study is. So they had people train for eight weeks, either to failure for every set or stopping one to two reps shy of failure. Why did I like this study design so much? For a lot of reasons. First off, they used people with at least three years of resistance training experience of at least three sessions per week. So great, they're using an experienced population. Over half of them had competed in some form of powerlifting or bodybuilding, so some kind of weightlifting related sport. They had them train for eight weeks, which is long enough to see differences typically between protocols. They used what was called an in-subject design. They had each subject act as their own control. Now you can either do it with a crossover design where you have one person do a protocol, then go through a washout period, and then do the other protocol. The problem is with resistance training, people will have adaptations to the first protocol that you can't fully wash out. So what they did, which is, I think should be the gold standard in resistance training when you can do it, is they compared one limb to another. They had people perform either single leg leg press and single leg leg extension on the right leg or left leg, one leg going to failure, one leg stopping one to two reps shy. Now what's great about this is you completely eliminate any genetic variability because the same person is their own control. So you're, they're comparing one of their legs to the other leg. Over an eight week time period, they would have one leg take every set to failure, the other leg stop one to two reps shy. They had them train twice a week. And another thing that I really loved about this study design was they looked at their previous training volumes and equalized the set number based off of their previous leg training volumes. This is such a smart move because we have seen in other studies looking at different volumes that sometimes the results don't seem to make sense. For example, uh, some of the studies show mostly that increasing volume tends to increase hypertrophy. But there are some studies that show that it doesn't have an effect. Well, when they go back and look at a lot of these studies, what can happen is if you have say a high volume group and a low volume group, Invariably, when you randomize people, you have some people in the high volume group that even though it's high for that study, it may actually be lower than what they were doing before. And you have some people in the low volume group that even though it's low for that study, it may be more than what they were doing before. So when they actually look at people who increase their set number from what they did previously, they see a pretty linear effect on hypertrophy. I thought this was a brilliant move that they are matching the volumes that the people were already trained to. That means that you're not having this effect of whatever their previous training volumes were affecting the outcome. They're meeting them where they're already adapted to. They also used a lot of measurements in this. So they looked at muscle thickness via ultrasound, body weight, velocity loss, meaning they were measuring the velocity of each rep, which is important to establish neuromuscular fatigue, and they established their RIR accuracy. So repetitions and reserve accuracy. So they were able to show when they asked people to terminate sets, which is one to two reps before failure, that they were actually accurate in doing that. So they had them come in and do pre-testing where they looked at, okay, how far can they go to get to failure with the different weights that they're gonna be using on single leg leg press and single leg leg extension, and then they use those as a baseline. So this was a really, really well-designed study. Like obviously I'm a little bit biased here because my coach is Zach and he was involved in the design and execution of this study but it really points out that this was a study designed by lifters who also know the science. So just huge kudos for a very well done design. Now it included men and women, which some people may think, well, that's a little weird. Why would you just do all one or the other? But when they looked at the statistics, they didn't see statistical differences between the men and the women. So they included those together. When you don't see statistical differences, you can't. And remember, each person is acting as their own control. So even if there were inherent differences between the men and women, it would be accounted for by the fact that each person has their own control. What were the protocols? They had them exercise twice a week, same volumes that they'd been doing previously. Now, if they were doing above 15 sets a week, they had them reduce their volume by 20%. The reason was they just needed people who were on high volumes not to have excessively long gym times because again, you're trying to time these people getting them through the training sessions because they're 
graduate students usually. That being said, anybody who had their volume reduced who was higher volume uh, had it reduced by the same amount. So again, and with the within person subject control, this makes it so really it's not a big deal because again, each person is serving as their own control. They also had them eat in a calorie surplus over the eight week period of time that would equate to them gaining about 1% of their body weight per month. Perfect, controlled lean gaining phase. And they made sure they were eating, I think at least two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. They were checking all the boxes to make sure this was lined up to be a study for experienced lifters, about experienced lifters, doing experienced lifter things, okay? The people that were doing the failure sets, they took every single set to failure. So, and they define that as when they can no longer complete the concentric portion of a rep and they would give them at least two seconds to try to get through the sticking point of the rep before they terminated the set. So they, they went to true failure. The other group was instructed to terminate their set one to two reps shy of failure. What did the results find? Well, first off, the big takeaway is there were no differences in muscle thickness. Okay, so there was no difference in muscle growth. They also, interestingly, found really no difference in the number of repetitions or the volume load that was performed. So repetitions is obvious, the number of repetitions, but volume load is the number of reps times the number of sets times the weight used. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, if you're training to failure, you're gonna do more reps than if you're stopping one to two reps shy. How could they have the same number of reps? Well, remember, they're taking every set to failure. Those people, and they showed this with their velocity data, they had more neuromuscular fatigue. So even though they probably got quite a few more reps, like one or two more reps on the first set, maybe the second set, those reps started declining. And they showed this, that they had a greater loss of repetitions over the course of the sets than the group stopping shy of failure. So for example, let's say you do a set and you can get 10 reps to absolute failure on your first set. And then you get seven, and then you get six, and then you get four. 27 reps. But... What if you stopped two reps shy of failure and just did sets of eight over the course of four sets, you'd have 32 reps. In many cases, actually stopping a rep or two shy of failure can get you as much or even more volume than if you took every set to failure. So they found there was really no difference in that. There was better reduction of neuromuscular fatigue with training shy of failure. This kind of goes against Zach's meta-regression he did that we covered probably about six to 12 months ago, where they showed that their muscular hypertrophy, that getting really close to failure seemed to increase gains. So how can we reconcile these two? Well, first of all, you have to realize the meta-regression was a meta-analysis of a bunch of different studies, which are heterogeneous in nature and have different protocols. Who knows if they were actually taking every single set to failure or maybe just the last set to failure, which I'm gonna talk about here in a minute. So I actually probably give this study a little bit more credence and here is an example of when I might actually put a randomized control trial above a meta-analysis just because of how well it was designed. In general, meta-analyses are considered higher forms of evidence and in general they are but a really, really well-designed human randomized control trial ooh, makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. How would I, what would be my practical takeaway from this? First of all, I don't think you have to never train to failure. I think you can absolutely train to failure, especially if you like it. What I would say is if you're going to train to failure, leave it to your final set. Let's take our example previously. You did sets of eight, getting ready. Then on your last set, take it to absolute failure because now you're not having impacts, negative impacts on subsequent sets. But if there is some extra benefit to taking a set to failure that we haven't picked up in the literature yet, you're getting that benefit. My takeaway is that you don't need to train to failure if you want to build muscle, even in advanced trainers. You've got to get pretty close and here's the rub. If you never have trained to failure, you probably don't have a really good idea of what it feels like. And the research shows that people who are not trained on RPE or RIR, that they will end sets about five reps shy of where they think they are. If you tell them, okay, go one rep shy of failure, and they stop and say nine reps, and they say, yeah, 10 would have been absolute failure. When they push them in studies, they actually get like 14 or 15 reps. If you have never trained to failure, it actually could be a good idea to actually train to failure just to see what that actually feels like, you can then have a better estimate of what your one or two RIR feels like. Because I can tell you, one or two RIR are not easy sets. These are still very difficult sets, but stopping shy of failure may actually help 
with helping you get more high quality sets in as well with better movement patterns, possibly diminish the risk of injury by managing neuromuscular fatigue. So guys, if you're interested in this style of training, it's one of the things we do with the BioLing Workout Builder. We have RIRs, RPEs built into a lot of our programs so that you can manage fatigue, but still build a lot of muscle and get really strong. So make sure you click the link in the description, check out the BioLing Workout Builder. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I will catch you next week.